of times I've tried to live my life according to my will. When darkness comes, it's difficult to rest and just be still. But Lord, you are my shepherd who guides me in the way, and I will that church he's all I need amen and I've come to praise him today and I appreciate church amen I love Sunday mornings I, I truly mean this whether I'm on vacation or whether I'm here there's nowhere else I'd rather be than in the house of the Lord amongst God's people we got something to sing about folks amen and I shall appreciate the Lord this morning I appreciate him I hope he's honored today as we meet together I hope I hope he looks down and smiles and uh, his name is exalted as, you know, old John Piper used to say that God is no more glorified than when his people are most satisfied in him. And that's real worship. That's the heart of worship. Amen. Not just by what God can give us, but who he is. I hope your heart is overwhelmed this morning. I know mine is. If you're glad to be saved, say amen. And I tell you what, I sure have enjoyed the Brown Family CD. If you've not got one, get one. And memorize them songs, Roy. It is awesome. And uh, I was worshiping the Lord, me and Ella. Praise God, we made it. Uh, Ella got her permit, and she drove me to church this morning. Where's Ella at this morning? She did good. She did good on the way. We made it. I kissed the ground when we got here. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just picking. She did, she did great. She's back here saying, Dad, Dad. But uh, nah, every time I get an opportunity to embarrass them, uh, Sam and Marshall, you, you know I want to. But, uh, but uh, it is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. So thankful to be here um, tonight. We do have service at 6 p.m. Uh, come out. It's going to be a special service tonight. We're going to spend about 30 minutes in preaching. And the church said, yeah, right. Now I'm just picking. We'll do 30 minutes of preaching. And then we're going to talk about uh, the future and uh, what we want to do at Calvary Baptist Church and the vision kind of that the Lord's given me and been praying about it. Not This is not flippant by no means. This is uh, has been bathed in prayer for months and uh, the direction we're going to go here. Just looking forward to seeing what God has in the future. I ain't leaving. All right, amen. But uh, y'all might want, I'm just saying, uh, I'm not leaving, but uh, I do have a vision for this place and just hoping that um, you, we can uh, see God work in a big way in the future. I'm thankful for where he, where he came from. Uh, this little church started with eight people when I got here a few years ago. And uh, I think it's about five years. Uh, Missy said that uh, this year is the seventh year uh, that Calvary Baptist Church um, has been here, but uh, almost closed its door a few years ago, and I'm sure thankful it didn't. Amen. And uh, but uh, so looking forward to what God has in the future for us. If you're visiting with us, thank you for being at Calvary Baptist Church. It's good to have Craig back with us. Give him a round of applause. And uh, Sandra broke his leg, 
and uh, he had to be out for a little while. I'm just picking. That ain't what happened. But uh, he had knee surgery and uh, is recovering from knee surgery. So uh, it is good to have you, Craig, back among us. And uh, we shall miss you when you're not here. And uh, let's, let's remember everybody that is not here this morning, Leon and Monty. And uh, they, they couldn't be here because of health. And let's continue to pray for Leon. Give him a phone call. Let him know you ain't forgot about him. And uh, minister to him in that way. The Bible says, bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. And uh, so keep the ones in mind that are not here, uh, Mildred and Terry, keep them in mind. But got a good crowd this Sunday morning. So thank you for being faithful to the house of God. It is the will of God for you to be in a local New Testament church. Amen. That is what the ecclesia is, by the way. It is the gathering together. And look, I understand some people can't be here because of sickness and health. And some of them work in certain, certain jobs. I understand all that. But, but look, it is the will of God for you to be gathered together. And you can't gather together while you're watching online. Amen. And I appreciate online service. But at the same time, that ain't church. You don't replace online with church attendance. That's not the ecclesia. And if that's all the church that you have, that ain't the right kind. Amen. You want to be engaged in a fellowship. But I'm not going to preach. Amen. We're going to get right into praise and worship this morning. So let's ask God to help us. Father, we come before you today and... This morning, I'm grateful for the day that you have made. I don't mean that just in repetition, Lord, but on purpose I say that. This is the Lord's day. This is Sunday. And I'm thankful that I've been raised in a family. I'm thankful that I'm part of a group of individuals that's been saved by the good grace of God this morning. Father, maybe there's someone that's come in today that, that don't know you as your Lord and Savior. Maybe they're like that prodigal that has uh, fallen away from the Father's house. They have departed from where they might ought to be. And I ask that today would be the day that you would bring them back home, Lord. That this morning, would you, would you comfort our hearts? Would you sustain the saints, Lord, and strengthen us to carry on? Father, this morning I, I ask, Lord, that you'd tune our hearts to sing your praise. And, Lord, that you would have conditioned the soul this week to where uh, our hearts are ready to receive what you have for us in preaching today. Lord, but may we come also offering the sacrifice of praise. Lord, I pray that you would clear our minds, clear our consciences, Lord, to clear the things that are taking place. Lord, I'm just asking if you know that song. Y'all know that song? So uh, right after, we're going to sing five verses with no chorus. We'll sing the five verses, and then after the fifth verse, we'll sing the chorus one time together. This is beautiful. Listen, pay attention to what we're singing as we praise the Lord this morning. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Sing with me today, church. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he behold that sacred head for sinners? Was it for crimes? Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love. Oh, that third verse, sing out with me. Well, might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in when Christ the mighty maker died for man the on that fourth thus might I hide my blushing face while Calvary's cross appeared these of my heart in thankfulness and melt my eye on that last but drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe listen here dear Lord I give myself away is all that at the cross here we go at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. Amen. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I... Let's sing it one more time. At the cross, at the cross.
this morning. I like what Amazing Grace says. I was blind, but now I see. People got to come to understanding that salvation is not an intellectual understanding. It's a spiritual awakening. Amen. It's the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. Jesus said, you must be born of water and of the spirit. And I appreciate the Lord this morning. Psalms chapter number five. Psalms chapter number five. Ezekiel says, I'll put my spirit within thee. And I appreciate the Lord this morning. and His work in salvation. He sealed us with a Holy Spirit of promise. Give ear. Psalms chapter 5, verse number 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider the meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for into thee will I pray. Ain't you glad that you don't have to go before an earthly priest for your prayers to be answered? But Jesus said in Hebrews to come boldly before the throne of grace. You know why? Because you have a great high priest in heaven. And his current word is that he continually makes intercession for you and I. Lift your voice to him today. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord, <laughs> on Sunday mornings. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. For thou art not a God that has pleasure in wickedness. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Let the church say Shazam. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. But as for me, I hope that's what you say this morning, but as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercies. In thy fear will I worship towards thy holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgression. For they have rebelled against thee. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy. Because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. Will thou compass him as with a shield. Father, your word says that you'll bless us with favor. You'll compass him with a shield. Lord, help us to rejoice in you this morning. Father, I come, but Lord, I need help. My eyes look towards you from whence cometh my help. I need help, Lord, to love my family. Lord, I need help, Father, to live beyond my own capacity. I need help, Lord, to remain faithful. Lord, I need help, Father, in having a desire to see others saved. Paul said, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel as they about to be saved. Lord, I pray that you'd stir your church, Lord. Lord, help us not leave the same we came in. Father, maybe we come this morning, we had no intention of changing. We had no intention, Father, of, of really meeting with you. Lord, I pray that today would be the day that you'd meet with your church and, Lord, that you'd revive us again. And Lord, we prayed weeks ago and asked that you'd revive us. And my prayers still are the same. Lord, revive us again. I love you today. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. 263. Miss Laura, I'm going to switch it up on us. 263. 263. Revive us again. 
We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse. Hope this is your song this morning. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Let's sing that last verse. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Let's sing that fourth verse one more time again. Fourth verse one more time. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Let's have a time of fellowship. Make our visitors welcome this morning. Children's Church, four to eight years old. Who's got Children's Church today? Salmon Marshall Children's Church, four to eight years old. Salmon Marshall.
All righty. Time to get started. Hope you come this morning seeking the Lord and um, ready to offer what God so rightfully deserves. And um, you know, when the Word of God is going to be preached in Sunday school, what great principles we learned this morning. I, I, I hope that we live in a world where we want to be entertained. Right, I mean, everything that we go to, like the, the commercials on television, we just want to be entertained. And spirituality ain't all about entertainment and excitement. It's about principle. It's learning to live by biblical principles. It's learning to discern, like what Josh was saying this morning in Sunday school. I thought he, he illustrated excellent about spiritual discernment on what's right and what's most right. And uh, what is the will of God for our life? We got to learn to live by biblical principle. And the problem is, in our culture that we live in, churches have replaced biblical principle with entertainment. Yes, they replaced the, the service. Instead of thus saith the Lord and preaching what the Bible says, uh, it, it's kind of a footnote to fit their narrative. And uh, look, look, I want as many people to come in this church as we can get, Brother Craig. But we got to keep the center focal point as the revelation of the will of God. Yes, That's why our music the way that is, is the way that it is. Yes, we don't have to do it like this. But we're going to do it like this. You know? you know, I believe this is honoring to the Lord. we got to keep the principles of God at the dead center of our church. And I hope that's what we're doing. So praise the Lord for that. It's good to have Brenda Guerin with us today. Everybody give her a round of applause. Come on, Miss Brenda. It's good to have Miss Brenda back today. And uh, thank you for being here, Miss Brenda. Really, we missed you while you were gone. And uh, so praise the Lord. Thank you for coming back uh, and being with us. Gentlemen, if you will come down to receive this morning's tithes and offering. Mark, I want to say thank you for, uh, while you're coming down here, thank you for replacing the outlets. Um, we didn't do good on our fire inspection. <laughs> uh, the fire inspector looked up under the sound table, let the church say Shazam. <laughs> but uh, he found about 16 different uh, power strips under there. And he's like, dude, you can't do that. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we got it all fixed. And Mark come over here and replaced some outlets and got all of our fire extinguishers hung back up. d Blaze got them inspected, so we're good to go. Mark, seriously, thank you for working at the church when nobody else sees you. And I appreciate your friendship, buddy. Really, I do. I appreciate what you do around here. Would you ask God's blessing on the, on offering? Lord, we love you. We just thank you for this opportunity to be here today and for the preaching of your word. And yes, Lord. Lord. Yes, sir. Yes, Lord. Amen.
I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above, and just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer will turn in, and you know a little fire is burning. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. It makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears. But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer. He knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. And he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer will turn in. And you know a little fire is burning. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. It makes it right. I love to see family sing together. I'd have liked to have been a fly on the wall when they were practicing that, wouldn't you? And, uh, but, but you know what? They were practicing together as a family. They were singing about Jesus as a family. When we leave that, we're leaving what church is all about. We're leaving what Christianity is all about. And I sure appreciate um, you know, Ashley and Tom and the Wilson family singing together and using their gifts for the glory of God. Uh, thank you for getting up here. Ashley, uh, I, since I've come here, I have listened to your voice develop and you grow in the talent that God has given you. And God has given you a talent. God has given you ability to sing. Thank you for using it for the glory of God. Serious. And uh, I love to see our young people uh, serving the Lord and being active in our church service. And take your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew. Hope you brought your Bibles this morning. Matthew chapter number 14 for the preaching of God's Word today. Matthew chapter number 14. Sometimes I preach off of an iPad, and I got my notebook today, and I got handwritten notes, and I uh, got, got a little more going on up here, so uh, bear with me as we go through this. If you're glad to be saved, say amen. If you got your Bible with you, say amen. Open that Bible up, Matthew chapter number 14. Uh, looking forward to preaching this sermon uh, this morning. This week, early this week, I'm saying like maybe Monday night, I was sitting on the couch and doing some reading, might even been Sunday night after church, doing some reading and just really gleaning on what Jesus said. And this thought jumped out at me. Now listen, what we're going to preach this morning, how many of us heard that preaching messes up good con or context sometimes, right? But uh, look, the context of this is the divine God became flesh. The miracles was a reflection of His divinity. That is that he was God in the flesh. Amen. The purpose of miracles when Jesus came was the expression of the glory of God in Christ Jesus. By miracles, we know that Jesus was divine. By the testimony of John the Baptist, we know that Jesus was divine. By the Old Testament scriptures that testify of a coming Messiah that would be born of a virgin, we know that Jesus was divine. There's testimonies, and that is the context of miracles in the, New, in, in the Gospels and in the New Testament. But uh, today I want to turn our attention to not the ability of Jesus, but to the heart of Jesus. Not to His ability or His divinity necessarily, but to His heart as He expresses His compassion in words to His disciples. What a great lesson! to learn from Jesus this morning. Look in Matthew chapter number 14, verse 13 and 25. I think we can all find some help here. I'm going to give you four reasons, four reasons why you need not depart. And you'll understand that as we read. Verse number 13 in Matthew chapter number 14. Everybody stand with me for the reading of God's Word this morning. Chapter 14, verse 13. We're a blessed people, folks. Amen. Yes, sir. <laughs> Look what's in front of you. Look what's in front of you. This is the revelation of God. 
without a doubt, without question, this is what the Bible claims to be. Matthew chapter 14, you have the very words of God in front of you. That's something. And when Jesus heard of it, this is right after John the Baptist died. You remember what Jesus said about John the Baptist? There was not a greater man born among men other than John the Baptist. Jesus loved John. Matter of fact, it was his cousin, uh, if you would. John the Baptist has just died. He departs into the wilderness. And when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals, which is food. But Jesus. Ain't you glad when somebody else point you a different direction, there's a but Jesus in your life? Amen. Yes, sir. If it would have been the disciples' decisions, they said, send the multitudes away. But Jesus said, they need not depart. Give you them to eat. And they said unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves of his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat <laughs> and were filled. And they took up the fragments that remained, 12 baskets full. And they had eaten, were about 5,000 men, besides or not counting the women and children. I want to focus this morning on one phrase. They need not depart. They need not depart. Father, this morning we come before you. Give us feet to stay. I pray that you'd guard us, that we wouldn't go astray. Maybe one today is departed and needs to come back. I pray that today would be the day that they reason within themselves, that the Spirit works as only it can do or only He can do and draw us back to where we ought to be. And as we see today, as where you will us to be. We see the desire of the heart, the glory of God revealed on the pages of Scripture, the heart of God, as He looked to the multitude with compassion. And Lord, help us to glean from this, learn from this. And I love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. There is first a great miracle to be considered that took place as they bring some fish and some bread to Jesus and Jesus turns what they had that was not sufficient into um, what is sufficient to feed, I would say, about 20,000 people if you count the women and children by what I had researched. There's a great lesson to be learned in this passage of Scripture concerning the heart of God, not just a miracle to be considered. And I think that's an error of the church today. Everybody's looking for signs and wonders. Everybody's looking for a miracle. And what we need to be looking for is the principles that need to be learned from the revelation of God. Amen. Jesus said, A foolish and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Quit looking for Jesus in your toast. Amen. And in the clouds. Well, we ought to look for Jesus in the clouds in one, in the clouds in one sense. But uh, there's also a great principle to be followed as we examine uh, this scripture. If you remember, I want to focus on that phrase. They need not depart. You remember in John chapter 6, verse 67? When Jesus said that, I am the manna from heaven, and if you're going to have fellowship with me, you must eat my flesh and drink of my blood. And the people looked at him and said, Do you hear what he said? This guy's crazy. And 
the disciples, certain disciples, departed from him. Then he turned to his true disciples and says, Will you also go away? Peter looked at him and said, Lord, <laughs> I could, we could sit right there and have church. Thou hast the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? I like the perspective of Peter. Josh, Peter got it right this time. How many of us find ourselves in Peter? Lousy me. To whom will we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. 1 Timothy 4, Paul says to his letter to Timothy, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that many shall depart from the faith. Many will leave where they ought to be. Like the prodigal son that left and departed from the father's house. Departing from the will of God. Many of us, as we have grew up, can point back even in our lives and look on where we've departed and thank God we've came back. Here in this passage, Jesus says they need not depart. The mass multitudes that were lost. We see the compassion that Christ has for the lost. For the ones that didn't know him. His words to his disciples were they did not depart. But there will come a time. In Matthew chapter 7. Where Jesus tells people the exact opposite. And he says depart from me. Ye that work iniquity. I never knew thee. This morning, I want you to consider three things as we get started. Consider the different forms of departing. Judas departed from Jesus, did he not? In a sense, he betrayed him. He sold him out. Departing is never a good idea. Demas walked away from Paul in ministry. John Mark had a uh, misfire, if you would. And went away uh, from Paul in ministry for a little while, but eventually returned. There is diverse forms of departing. Listen to me, young people. Listen to me, young people, all eyes up here. There's no reason to depart. They need not depart. Young people, if I was 16 years old, if I was 15 years old, and I can go back to my 15-year-old self that I thought I knew everything, I would tell myself, look, you don't know everything. And I tell myself, you get as much counsel as you can from the people around you that cares about you. Right. And I would write in my Bible right now, there's no need to depart. Amen. There's no need to depart. You don't have to be the prodigal. You don't have to depart from the will of God. Yes. The demise of departing. People walked away from this instance of Scripture, or this, this, this miracle, this uh, situation, and left the only means of salvation. You know, I was considered as I was reading this passage the other night, they were not promised another um, time that they would see Jesus. Maybe many in that crowd, the 20,000 that, that, that were fed, I wonder if they ever saw Jesus again. I wonder if they ever got to hear them words again, they need not depart. They departed, but yet... I wonder if they ever got a chance to hear them words again from the divine that became flesh. The delightful reality of the departure. You can always come back. Don't be like the stony ground that will not receive the word. Four reasons we have not, four reasons we have to not depart from the Lord. First, I want us to see this. Look in verse number 13. Four reasons I want to give you this morning on there's no reason to depart. To reason with yourselves. To whom will we go? First, I want you to see this. The concern Jesus expressed. Why should I not go anywhere else? Why should I stay with this God-man? Why should I stay with the Christ? Why should I stay with the Messiah? Why should I stay with Jesus? Young people, you write this down in your Bible. You memorize this in your heart. Why should you stay for Christ? First, because the concern he expressed Amen. for them. 
1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. There's no reason to depart first because he cares for you. You know he cares for you a lot more than Satan does. Satan says, oh yeah, just go out and have, have fun. Going to church is boring. Hanging out with church people is boring. Doing the will of God is boring. That's what Satan tells you. But what the Lord tells you is for your good. He cares for you. The concern that was expressed as he looked into the multitudes, and here's what he said to his disciples. They don't need to go anywhere. I have everything that they need. They need not depart. Young people, there's no reason to depart because God cares for you. Amen. Psalms 55, 22, the Lord says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. I'm talking about reasons to stay because he cares for you. God is not willing that any should perish. But all should come to repentance. It is not the will of God for you to depart and leave the Father's will for your life. We see the concern is witnessed through His words. You hear that? God's concern. How do you know that God cares for you? Look at the revelation of God that's sitting in front of you. God always wills for us to live by faith. Not faith in some uh, superstitious nonsense. That's the problem with charismatic movement today. It's not rooted and grounded in the Word. And God says that you are to sanctify them by thy truth, for thy Word is truth. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed there according to thy Word. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How do I know that God cares for me? How do I know that God's concerned for me? Because this is the revelation that He has given you and I. Look into His Word and see His concern. First, his concern was for people that were sick. Do you see that in, in uh, verse number 13? Um, I'm sorry, in verse number 14, it says, He was moved with compassion towards them, and he healed their sick. They were sick physically. You know that God is concerned about your physical illnesses? Watch, wait, wait, wait. I want us to pause here real quick. Physical illness is a result of sin. It's not a result of your daddy's sin. It's not a result oftentimes of your individual sin. It is a result of the consequence of sin on the human nature. Right? But God can take what sin does to human nature and make good of it. God can use the bad things that sin causes in our life for the good of our own selves. Um, people were sick. They were not just sick physically, they were sick spiritually. He's seen them as, uh, there was one instance where Jesus looked at the multitudes and he said, I see them as sheep having no shepherd. Away from the flock of God. And God had a concern for the one that was away from God. God cares about your future. God cares where you're headed. You know, I know that's hard for us to believe. Why does God care? I don't really know the answer to that. But all I know is the Bible tells me that he loves me. Amen. And I remember growing up in... Sunday school, learning Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. And I, look, this is not a superficial hope. A lot of people have a superficial hope when on their dying bed that, well, they lived a good life. Look, we don't have to have a superficial hope. We can have a biblical hope. We can have a hope based on faith on what the Word says, that Jesus loves us. And Jesus is concerned with you and with your future and with your head. And listen, young people, God cares where you go to college. God cares if daddy tells you to wash your truck and you don't wash your truck. God tells you, God cares if you keep your room clean. Young people, God cares if you are involved in a local New Testament church. Don't let these heretics and false teachers seduce you otherwise. Uh, they'll pull the wool over your eyes. They'll take you out of the will of God. And Satan is telling the multitude, come on, ain't no reason to listen to this guy. Come on, look, he's going he's to be done speaking soon. Let's just go right back to the way that we were living. And Jesus tells them there's no need to depart. There's no need to depart. We see his concern expressed to sick people. Watch this. His disciples would have sent them away. Ain't that something? 
the, the people that were there would have been led astray by one thing or another. Well, what if Jesus didn't say that? They would have. What if Jesus said, stop, Peter, James, and John, the sons of thunder, sons of Zebedee, stop. Don't tell them to stay because I desire. I like what this I like what happens. Young people, look, look, I want you to see the picture in your mind. I don't want you to hear me. I want you to see what I'm saying. When Jesus told them not to depart, you know what he did? He gave them everything that they were in need of that day. Amen. And he set them on the grass. Amen. And he broke the bread and the fishes. And he provided fellowship for them right. with God. Amen. You realize that? You know what God wants you to do? He wants to sit you on the grass and have fellowship with you. Praise the Lord for that, folks. Listen, we see the concern he expressed. They were subjective to other things taking them away. Look, can I explain this to you, young people? Even though Jesus has a concern for you and old people alike and middle-aged people, right? Jesus is concerned for you, but that doesn't mean... That we're not subject for other things to take us away for us to depart. We have all kinds of distractions in this life that takes us away from where God wants us to be. How much work is a good thing? Let the church say amen. I like to work. I enjoy what I do. But sometimes I have to stop so I don't remove myself where I ought to be. See what I mean? Spiritually speaking. I know that God is concerned about me. I know that God is concerned about my priorities. And it is a priority that a man ought to work. Let the church say amen right there. A man ought to get off his rear end and go to work and support his family. If he don't, the Bible says he's worse than an infidel. Right, Young people, you know, what, you know, you know how you're going to pay for your car? college? You're going to work for it. Right? You know how you're going to pay for your car? You're going to work for it. You know how you're going to pay for your insurance? You're going to work for it. But look, life's not all about work. We've got to learn to prioritize and that we are subject for things, even good things, like the disciples, to take us away from where we ought to be. How many of us know that people at church can hinder you from serving the Lord? Or not be that way, or ought not be that way, but you're going to have to learn who you pick and choose to hang out with. It's very important who you choose to have in your circle. Let me tell you something. Because there's some people that come up all in your business that can lead you right out of where you're supposed to be. Yeah, but it's a lot nicer to be at the lake on Sunday. Right? It's a lot nicer to, you know... Come over here and, and do this hobby on the Lord's Day. you got to be careful because movies you watch, entertainment that you allow in your life. Brother Josh, you was talking about the heart this morning, about our heart is deceitfully wicked above all. Not only does the Bible teach us that our heart is deceitfully wicked, but it tells you to guard your heart. You know why? Because you are subject to depart. Yes, sir. Uh, wh- what is that? Bind my wandering heart to thee. I was listening to that song by the Brown family this morning. Old Brianna, she was over, man, she was just playing that piano, Miss Laura. She was playing it good. And she says, bind my wandering heart to thee. And a tear rolled down my eye coming to church. Because I know who I am. I know I am subject to depart. Right? By other things around us. Be aware of that, church family. Consider his concern for the multitude. He, can, he was concerned for them. And I'm thankful for that. And they were in want. They didn't have enough. He took time. He took time. You might have not taken time to get to know Jesus, but Jesus is willing to take time to get to know you. (laughs) One of my favorite passages of Scripture is in John chapter 4. You know what it says? Jesus must needs. I love this Old Testament English, right? Or this uh, old King James language. He must needs to go through Samaria. Why? 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 Because there was a little woman there that was in adultery. But he was going to take some time to fellowship with her. You know that Jesus is willing to take time for you. 
Just as we see here in the passage of Scripture, these things are written for your examples. These things are, Christian, listen to me. This is written for us, for us to glean, for us to know. This is, but God commended. That means He put on display. He manifested His love to us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. That's what the Bible is. It's a manifestation of the glory of God. We don't see just His ability. We see His heart here that He cares for them and that He's taking time for them. Do you know that if you just stop departing, Stop where you're at. You'll learn that Jesus will take time for you. You know, let, let me tell you something. Let me, let me be real. We got a teacher in here. Um, was Emma's and Ella's teacher from Tabernacle. Is that right? She's grinning. You know, I never was a good reader. You might not have knew that by listening to me talk, but I never was a good reader. Amen? Mama? I was the one in Sunday school, Josh, that would count the people in that was it was my turn, Richard, that I'd done read that verse 16 times so I could at least pronounce it in front of people. Let me tell you something, though. I, I'm being honest, dead serious. I was in Pee Wee Patch, and I got to memorize the Bible, and I got to read my Bible. Right? How many of us know that our hearts are subject to be drawn away? Right? But when I took some time and sat down with Jesus, Jesus took time with me. I honestly believe God gave me ability to read because I just stopped. And our last point with the abundant supply that he gives, do you know that the supply that he gave was in light of what was given to him with their life? Did y'all miss that? The supply that he gave was in uh, connection with the, uh, was what was given back to Jesus. Right? That's a spiritual truth, folks. If you take time... To say, Lord, what do you want? Young people, look. I know I'm talking to young people this morning a lot. But my heart's broken. I don't want you to leave the house. I don't, leave, I don't want you to leave the Father's house. Could you take some time this morning and know this, that God cares for you and that God loves you and that God is willing to take time for you to mold you? You know what? He'll let you go through hard times. You know what that is? That's God taking time with you. You say, say God, I don't understand why I wanted this, but I can't get this. Well, that's the Lord taking His time with you and molding and making you and what He wants you to be. You know, God will work all things together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purposes. Young people, you need to know it might not work out like you think. It didn't work out like I thought. How many of us parents can say that? It didn't work out like I thought. But watch. God was taking time to mold and make you. I love that, that, that Jesus took time with, with the multitude to teach them. God takes time to teach us, to train us. And I think we can see that. He made communion possible. The consistent pattern in Jesus' life was that he took time with Zacchaeus. He took time with a woman at the well. He went with the disciples for three years. He went to Jairus' house. To meet his need, to heal his daughter. And he went specifically to the blind man that was in need. All I'm saying is there a consistent pattern in the revelation of God in Scripture that he takes time for his own. Right? We need to learn that. Not only does he care about us, his care about us is manifested in the time he takes for the individuals that he loves. He took time for the multitude. He didn't have to. He could have been busy and just carried on his way. But he took time. He stopped here. The disciples said... Send them away. We don't have what they need. Send them away. We're in a desert place. They need to go get some dinner. Let the men say amen right there. You know, Brother Richard, Richard I don't know why I'm going to say this. I am, though. But the older I get, the more I care about dinner being ready when I get home. How many of us are right there? I mean, you know what I mean? Like, the older I get, it's like when I get home from work, I'm like, Candy, where's the dinner? You know, where, where's my food? I'm hungry. And uh, sometimes I've been skipping lunch lately. And then when I skip lunch, I'm even more intensified when I get home. But where's dinner at? And that's where these people was at. You know, they were going for dinner. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just picking. But uh, seriously, he, um, he took time for them. Not only did he take time, but he showed compassion. Man, there were people everywhere. And you know what Jesus didn't do? Jesus didn't take a ball bat, Rick, and beat them over the head. Right? He didn't. He, a lot of people portray God as a big ogre in the sky that hates everybody and throws stones at people. 
that he's judgmental. He is a judge. Right? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But at the same time, he's a God of compassion. You know, what, you know what the word compassion means? That he felt for the people that was in front of him. Let me ask you a question. When, when somebody cuts you off on the interstate, how do you feel about them? Me and Mark was on our way up to uh, somewhere. Where were we going, Mark? Winston or something like that, going up towards that forsaken place. But anyway, um, and uh, we, we were on the interstate, and man, this car. We, we had the skid steer on the back, and we were in the 550, and this car come. Mark, am I lying? He about took our fender off. Like, I mean, he was right in front of us, you know. Exactly. Going sideways to get between us. It was, it was scary. I didn't feel very <laughs> affectionate or compassionate about the individual driving that car. You know what I mean? I was thinking maybe, you know, bump him. You know, but, uh, but all I'm saying is this right here. When's the last time you felt compassion for somebody else? You know that God was moved with compassion about people that were sick, physically and spiritually. Maybe you come in this morning and you find yourself that you are spiritually sick in the sense that you're not where you ought to be. I want to remind you of this. God is a God of compassion. I was reading uh, in, the, in the scripture earlier this morning, and I can't remember where it was, 2 Corinthians. God is known as the Father of mercies. He is the God of compassion. He is the Father of mercies. He's the God of charity. And um, we, we see that when there was a woman taking an adultery. Say, say, preacher, God don't care about me because I don't always get it right. God don't care about me because, well, I wasn't born into the right family. I didn't grow up in church. My daddy wasn't a deacon. I'm not a member of a Baptist church. You say, God don't care about me. I've got a lot of stains on my past. Can I, can I remind you of a woman that was taken in adultery that was brought to Jesus? You know what Jesus did? He took time for her. You know what everybody else would have done? They would have cast stones on her and stoned her. But it was the man Jesus that stood there and showed compassion and was the God of charity and that felt for that woman. You mean the felt for the woman that was undeserving? Yeah, that one. The, the one that showed mercy to her, withheld what she deserved, but then showed grace, give her what she didn't? That's who our God is, folks. I mean, this is the manifestation of the glory of God expressed on the pages of Scripture as you see Jesus with a group of individuals that were sick. And he felt for them. I was reading this and I said, God help me. What a lesson for his disciples. Josh said this this morning, my four and no more. What he said. In my case, my six and no more. What a lesson for his disciples when his disciples was leading the multitude away. And Jesus said, wait, they need not depart. He took time with them. He showed compassion. Amen? Amen? But watch this. Not only did he take time, not only was he concerned, not only did he show compassion, but he gave abundant supply. Let me, tell you, let me tell you something. Reasons not to depart because he's concerned, because he takes time, because he shows compassion, and because of the abundant of supply there was a time in my life to where listen to me I, 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 y'all bear with me I'm, this is my last point last point the abundant supply in my life what I've experienced and I know experience is subjective right but what I've experienced following Christ has been an abundant supply and it looks like this it looks like Satan wants to blind us with which way we ought to go. The world tries to distract, distract us in things that look appetizing. But yet, the end result of the road of distraction and sin is death and decay. And you experience that as you live a life full of regret. Or you look at what the scripture says about the way of the transgressor is tough. You can experience that. One of the reasons I know the Bible is true is because it has experiential relevance. Amen. Because it is relevant. You apply the principles found in the Word of God. Yep. Even, a, even if a lost man applies the financial principles, let the church say Shazam, in the, in the Bible, 
then he'll be blessed for it. That's the power of the word. I like what Jordan Peterson says, and I don't agree with everything he says, so don't, don't let... He said this, the word of God is truer than true. It's connected to every generation. It's shaped this world. The founders of America founded us on the principles. Uh, You know what I'm talking about? The abundance of supply. I'm talking about when you apply the principles found in the scripture, you see an abundant supply. America has been the most prosperous and powerful nation ever founded in the history of the world. Why? Well, there's some principles that was applied. George Washington said, It is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. I wish Jackson was in here. He'd probably cry if he was. But this week we have, I've learned, I've learned, I've learned Jackson this. I told you I wasn't good at English, but uh, I have taught Jackson A is for Adam. In our homes, you know, like A is for apple, C is for caterpillar. I can't remember what B was for. Y'all remember that, how we learned the alphabet? B is for what? Ball. B is for ball, right? How about this? A is for Adam. God made him from dust. He wasn't a monkey. He looked just like us. Though some scientists don't think it was so. It was God who was there. And he ought to know. Amen. We ought to teach our children biblical principle. Why? Abundance of supply. You see what Jesus done? (laughs) That song we sing as a choir. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Little is much when God is in it. Amen? They brought what they had. Young people, individual Christian in the audience this morning, just bring Jesus what you have. Just give Him your all. Give Him your... Give him your best, and what you'll find is an abundant supply. I'll close right here. I want to imagine. Can can I use your imagination? Roy, can I borrow your imagination just for a second? What? Sure. They're telling us what he's going to say. Let me borrow your imagination. I want you to imagine, and this passage of Scripture is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. But elsewhere in the Bible we find where the basket, the fish, and the loaves come from. You know who they come from? Help me now. Bible students, who'd they come from? They didn't come from the disciples. They come from a little lad. And I imagine something like this. The little lad left home today, and Mama fixed him his lunch, and he went out by the seashore to play. Right? And found, find his buddies. And they find themselves in this predicament, and there's a little lad here and says, I've got some fish and loaves that I'm willing to share. I'm willing to give this man named Jesus what I have. You know the Bible teaches in this passage of Scripture, verses 19, 20, 21, that there was 12 baskets left over. I wonder if that little lad come back home, (laughs) and he didn't have one basket, but he had 12 trying to carry them in. And his mom might have looked at the little lad and said, where did you get all them baskets? I got to tell you, Mama, I give this man Jesus everything I had. I come back with 12 baskets full. Amen. Amen. I mean, don't you imagine something like that? Church, I want you to come back with 12 baskets full. There is no reason to depart. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of abundance of supply. That's the last point. So this morning, why can I give you four reasons not to depart? Because he's concerned for your life. Because he's willing to take time. He's willing to show compassion. And there is an abundance of supply in following the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you this morning. Oh, I'm so thankful uh, to be a part of the ministry of God. Lord, I'm so thankful, Lord, to what we have heard this morning. I pray that you would take what was read, what was taught, what was preached, 
and help us apply it to our hearts today. Lord, I pray that you would make application. The Holy Spirit would work in a way that I can. And Lord, that would put your finger on places in our lives that, are, that we have departed. Lord, help us to come back home and realize that there's forgiveness. And I'm reminded of that prodigal son, that when he did come to himself, he went back home, and what he found was an abundant supply from the Father. And I ask, Lord, you'd help us. We love you. In Jesus' name, all heads bowed and all eyes closed. Say, preacher, today I found myself, and I'm departed from where I ought to be spiritually. I'm li- specifically, I'm living in a way that is not pleasing to God. And this morning, I was reminded that God cares about that in my life. I'm reminded that God would take the time to help me in it. And I'm willing to be the ones that does not depart, but ready to be right with God. If that's you this morning, say, preacher, I'm lost, and I'm ready to come to where I ought to be spiritually. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Say, preacher, I'm ready. It's me. It's me. God's been knocking on my door. Maybe you're a Christian this morning. People are coming. Maybe you're a Christian this morning. And you say, Preacher, I've been watching things I ought not watch. Preacher, I've learned I need to prioritize my life a little better than I have been. Maybe that's, maybe that's you. Would you raise your hand? Be honest with God. Say, I'm a Christian, but I need to learn to prioritize my life better. Amen, church family. Ask God to help you in this. Remember, he's a God of compassion. He's a God that cares, and he'll take time. People are still praying, so please be patient. Just to be aware of the passage and just not take it to heart because we're familiar with it. Oh, Lord, I pray that we'd, you'd help us to go deeper than that and further than that. Don't leave us alone, Lord. Help your church be what it ought to be. I love you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for the ones that came this morning.